gusto de visitar al doctor eh, Tushar Basharajani. Eh, él, es el, él es investigador de la tisis vascular. Actualmente se de, desempeña el cargo de presidente del Comité Educacional de la Sociedad Internacional de Nefrología. Aparte, es un experto internacional en los centros intervencionistas y actualmente es director de la Nefrología eh, Intervencionista de la Fundación Clínica de Tira. Eh, en esta oportunidad, el doctor va a exponernos el tema Cuidados para prolongar la patencia del acceso vascular. Doctor Buchar. Thank, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Castillo and Dr. Jose, for inviting me here. I'm really delighted to be here. This is my first visit here, and I'm making lots of friends out here. So, looking forward to building on this friendship. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, how to prolong the patency of vascular access. So this morning we had very good sessions that outlined some of the problems that we face on a day-to-day -day basis in our clinical practice. Uh, I wish I had a magical answer or a bullet to say, hey, do this one, two, three, and four, and all your vascular access problems will be resolved. Unfortunately, that's not what we see in real life. In real life, it still remains a challenge. Uh, the challenge starts right when the patient really gets diagnosed with CKD and is progressing towards end-stage renal disease. And, and how to get that patient soon enough to see a nephrologist and then the surgeon to get the vascular access created. But before that, I think uh, what, what really matters to us at, at, at once the patient really gets close to starting dialysis is how do we keep this, these accesses uh, patent. So my talk is going to kind of go over some of the issues that we see on a day-to-day -day basis that can really make a difference when it comes to prolonging the access frequency. Uh, these are some of my disclosures. I am a member of the uh, NKF Vascular Access uh, Guideline Committee. We are soon, I've, I've been hearing about this soon. It's been almost three years. We've been trying to finalize these guidelines. I think right now they are in the final draft and publication stage. So hopefully early uh, 2020, we should have this new guidelines in print. I'm also the chair of the uh, Education Work Group of International Society of Nephrology, and I sit on the board of the International Board of Directors for uh, Avatar, which is a major uh, access-focused foundation in India. So we all know about this lifeline as well as an Achilles heel. This is what really frustrates us when we try to treat our patients. It frustrates the surgeons because these patients keep coming back again and again with the same problem once. And, and it frustrates the interventionalist, whoever it is, whether it's a nephrologist or a radiologist. We don't have a permanent fix. These patients get procedures again and again and again. The patients ultimately get tired. So uh, just a brief overview, and, and, and again, this is something uh, I, I thought would, would, would set the stage. Some of it has already been covered in, in the earlier talks, but I think it's better to have some reputations that any access, and then using the right terminology, so we don't use permanent access because no access is permanent. Access is long-term access is what we really want. Catheter is a bridge access and an arteriovenous fistula and arteriovenous graft is a long-term access. And access is not just the anastomosis that is created uh, by the surgeon with an artery in the vein or placing a, a PTFD graft or a synthetic material between an artery and the vein. It's an entire circuit. So we have to think of access as an entire circuit. And, and generally for a fistula, it takes about six to eight weeks to mature. Um, for a graft, uh, it, it generally takes about two to three weeks to mature. And then there are newer graft designs that are available that can be uh, within 24, 48 hours, the early generation grafts. Primarily, again, this is what we have talked about this morning, uh, that to prolong the patency, prolong the life of an access, it needs to be a team approach. It cannot be just one discipline that is that that is responsible or that should be responsible for keeping the access patient. So a surgeon can do an excellent job of creating a fistula. Uh, uh, an interventionalist can do an excellent job of keeping the fistula open when there is a dysfunction. But even in between, if, before these problems come up, we as a community, people who are taking care of all the dialysis patients, the nurses, 
uh, I know there are no technicians here, but in the US we have technicians and the patients themselves can play a major role in, in identifying dysfunctional access and helping the access to uh, being kept patent. So having a team approach and having all disciplines work together in unison will definitely help our patients and ultimately help reduce some of the frustrations that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the ultimate goal here is we want the catheters to be out as soon as possible. So many patients land into the hospital with like crash landers who come in with an urgent need to start dialysis and they get a catheter. But the sooner we get the catheter out, the better it is for these patients. And Certainly, we don't want to see this in our dialysis patients where the nurse is really trying to convince the patient that the multiple attempts that ultimately are we get an access and two needles in the patient. This really increases the anxiety for the patient. There's a lot of pain involved with it with multiple attempts. And, and it's, it's the experience that ultimately drives the patients to go away from dialysis and you really don't want that. And the common problems that we all know and we have seen in practice is, is the stenosis. First of all, when the access is created, the access, not all access is mature, especially the AV fissure that we don't mature. There's a fairly high primary failure rate. Uh, in the US, there's large study sponsored by NIH, the Dialysis Access Consortium. Uh, in, in that study, about 600 patients were enrolled and the primary maturation failure rate was almost 60. Uh, but once the fistula matures, there is stenosis due to new internal hyperplasia. The stenosis in the AV fistula is, is generally in the juxtaanastomotic region in the segment that's close to the anastomosis as well as in the cannulation segment. And in, in the AV grafts, it's mainly at the graft vein anastomosis. And as the stenosis gets uh, tighter and tighter, so as the grade of stenosis worsens, these patients then have decreased flow and ultimately uh, thrombosis of the axis. Uh, the other complications that we see with the axis is, uh, which, which is very uh, commonly seen in, 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 in the dialysis units when even though the fistula may be very well maintained or very well created and very well matured, if, this, if the dialysis staff who is going to cannulate these axes, if they are not trained well, then there can be problems of infiltration of hematoma and even losing the access at times. Uh, aneurysms, aneurysms and infections are again uh, something that we really need to be uh, cognizant about. Now this morning uh, we did see uh, various kinds of accesses created and one of the access created was the transpositioning of the basilic vein from the forearm to either the radius, uh, radial artery or to the upper arm in the brachial artery and, and this is one such example where uh, how educating the patients can really help. So whenever there is excessive mobilization, the segment that is mobilized gets ischemic and leads to stenotic lesions. And, and so here you can see uh, the, the stenosis at the mobilized segment keeps recurring. And, and this was in a patient who really was very familiar with the, the, the thrill in the fistula and he would he would examine the fistula himself on a regular basis, and each time he felt the thrill going down, he would come and alert the staff, and that's how he would get a fistulogram, and the fistulogram would obviously help improve the uh, uh, stenosis and keep the access patent. So again, the point here is educating the patients to examine their own fistula on a daily basis. Here is something that you really don't want to see. This was a very nicely created upper arm fistula, the brachiocephalic fistula created well in advance before the patient really needed dialysis. The patient went to the dialysis unit for his first treatment, and unfortunately, it was infiltrated because the technician who cannulated this person was new, and this person really landed up with a huge hematoma that resulted in the patient receiving a catheter. Luckily, the fistula remained patent, but obviously, it's not usable. So. Had, had, I mean, did need a catheter to, to tide over the time frame of four to six weeks until the hematoma settled down. Aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms, again, these are something that we see, commonly seen because of bad cannulation techniques uh, and also sometimes with 
and outflow stenosis. So if you see this, try to get to the bottom of the, of, of the pathology and, and treat the pathology soon enough so that uh, if there is any venous hypertension, if there is any outflow stenosis, that can be treated in a timely manner. And as you all know, this is not cost effective. I mean, it adds a huge amount of money to the healthcare costs. Uh, it's, it's a big burden to the society, it's a big burden to the uh, health budget. Uh, and, and this is an old study, but it still is very true where uh, patients who have fistulas compared to grafts and catheters have the least amount of expenses. So, again, every attempt should be made to try and get a fistula in place sooner the better. Um, and of course, if the patients are willing for PD, patients on PD are least expensive to the system and to the society. So how do we really take care of an access? And the way I think about it is, we, we think about it as new accesses versus established access. And, and the key here is monitoring. And, and monitoring both new accesses and established access on a regular ongoing basis can help detect a dysfunctional access soon enough. Uh, and, and once an access dysfunction is detected, patients can be then appropriately referred either to an interventionist or to a surgeon or whatever other resources that you may have to correct that dysfunction. Uh, new access journey needs to be uh, monitored on, a, on, on a, at least on a weekly basis for the first six to eight weeks to assess for maturity. If the access is not maturing after six weeks or eight weeks, then that's a problem. That access needs to be intervened and that access needs to be evaluated in a more rigorous fashion. Uh, again, educating the patient here makes it makes a big difference. So once the, uh, once the surgical wound has healed, educating the patient about how to feel for thrill, how to listen if they are able to listen, but at least feel for the pulse and feel for the thrill is something that can be easily taught to the patient that they can check on a daily basis. Uh, and, and then if they come up with a problem, take their problem and listen to their problem seriously and, and evaluate and get an intervention done if it is appropriate. For established access, uh, the, the general principles, and, and here what I'm trying to go over is the general principles that can help keep the access patent when the patient is in the dialysis unit. So once an access is established, you, you really want to focus on the central part here, regular access monitoring, that's the key. Unfortunately, this is this is simple, but it's not practice. Uh, we, we learn about access, uh, we learn about physical examination in medical school, and access monitoring is, is a simple physical examination which often gets neglected for several reasons, either laziness or time constraints. Uh, at least in the US, we have heard complaints from the nurses that it eats away a lot of time and really it does not eat away a lot of time. It does not take more than a minute to examine the major fistula. Uh, using aseptic techniques, again that that uh, that has to be very rigorous and, and consistent. Aseptic techniques can, can prevent infections and, and especially with catheters you really want uh, and with fistulas too and with fistulas and grafts you want to use aseptic techniques so that uh, the accesses don't get infected. Proper cannulation technique, teaching the nurses how to cannulate, I and mean, that's important. As I, as I mentioned earlier, the access may be perfect, but if it's ruined of the very first intervention, you lose the opportunity of, of, of uh, preventing a catheter placement, and, and that can lead to catheter-related complications. And then post-needle withdrawal hemostasis. How do we achieve hemostasis after the needle is withdrawn? That's equally important. The needle bevel is sharp, so if you if you apply unnecessary undue pressure, it's going to cause tears in the vessel wall, and that can lead to more hematoma around the axis when the needle is removed. And then the four corners that I have here, so vessel preservation strategies, that is something, if you have a good vessel to begin with, that the surgeon can work on, that can give you a good access, that can potentially last longer. So having in your CKD population, having access or uh, vessel preservation, and we had a good, excellent talk in the morning, vessel preservation should include both arteries and veins. Timely recognition of access dysfunction. So with these techniques, you will have 
timely dis access dysfunction that's identified, meaning timely referral to either uh, endovascular person or to a certain order or maybe the appropriate uh, intervention. And then at every stage, including the patient in, in the whole process, making the patients responsible for their own care and, and, and making them understand that their inter intervention is also equally important in helping prevent some of the complications. So access monitoring, what does access monitoring really mean? And, and this was something that Christian first initiated, uh, proposed this way back in 2003. Uh, and, and this has really helped to a, to a large extent, but it's not really implemented uh, even in the US to, to the extent that we really would like to see it. Uh, access monitoring uh, has been shown to be equally good com when compared to some of the other modalities of surveillance like uh, venous pressure monitoring, online venous pressure monitoring, or transonic ultrasound monitoring. Those are techniques that are complementary, yes, but they are not necessarily possible to be done on a daily basis. So those are done on a, week, on a monthly basis at the most. And if you collect too much data with online monitoring, really nobody looks at it. So it, it just defeats the whole purpose. Uh, developing a simple approach for access monitoring to be used both by the patient and by the dialysis staff is, is equally important. So it's, it's the entire, again, the entire team that really needs to take care and, and take up this as a challenge. Uh, and access monitoring simply means doing a good physical examination. And when done correctly, there are studies that have been shown compared to uh, a gold standard angiogram, access monitoring identifies almost, it's, it's almost 85 to 90 percent specific specific and sensitive. So there's good specificity and good sensitivity with uh, just physical examination alone when performed properly. Uh, again, Krishna first gave this tool. Uh, this tool is also available in, in Spanish. So if you want to use this and incorporate it in your practice, you can really use that. It's, it's three main principles, look, listen, and feel, which the patients can do easily, the nursing staff can do easily on a daily basis. Arm elevation, which the patient can do very easily. You raise the arm, if there is outflow obstruction, the vessel will not collapse. So it's, it's a very easy test to perform for the patient when, on a daily basis. And then uh, augmentation test to assess for the uh, inflow stenosis or adequacy of inflow. So these, these four or five steps can be done in less than a minute. The problem here is, yes, these are simple steps, but oftentimes, Things are not done, and we, re we rely too much on tests. And, and, and as this cartoon clearly shows, we, we, we want to rely on too much on transonic flow measurements, vascular access, continuous monitoring, when a simple physical examination can do the trick. Again, patients can be equally part of their own care. So look, listen, and feel. It, 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 it can be easily talk to the patients. Uh, and, and, and actually, I, ha I have a story here to tell. I had one patient uh, who had a three-year-old granddaughter who would sit in the patient's lap, keep the head on the patient's arm, listen to that buzzing sound, and, and would say, hey, I like to listen to the train in your arm. That's how the little girl described it. One day, the girl said, I cannot listen to the train. I don't hear the train. Something's wrong. And that prompted the grandmother to come down to the access center it had just thrombosed, we were able to open it up right away. So uh, yes, if a three-year-old child can pick up a difference between what is normal and what is not normal, I think uh, our patients definitely, when they are told what to look for, they, they, will, they will be their own uh, evaluators on a daily basis. Uh, again, this is another tool for, directed for the patients where they are, I mean, it clearly goes over what to look for, redness, infection, rash, aneurysms, bulging, pain. So all of these things are very well described. This is also available in Spanish. So if, if you want to incorporate it in your, in your practice, there's, there's a way to incorporate this. And, and then don't forget about the patients who have catheters and who are getting uh, an AV fistula created. So even though the patient may start with a catheter, the AV fistula has been created. We don't want to forget about it and, and continue to monitor. So, what do we need to look for at each week 
if one, two, four, six, and ten for it to be uh, assessed for maturity. And once it is mature, start using it so the caterpillar can come out. What you really want is less time with the caterpillar. And and we have a system where, or we have a practice where, when the catheter comes out, we somehow make the entire dialysis unit know that Mr. John's catheter came out and we clap or we make it as a celebratory uh, event where the other patients who may have a catheter may also be, okay, my catheter needs to come out soon too. So access monitoring clearly is easy uh, to perform. It engages the patients. It, it empowers the patients. It engages the entire dialysis team and it, and it, and it works. Besides this, what can help with the access uh, patency and long-term patency? Well, the other complications that are really commonly seen in the dialysis unit with the access is infection. Uh, making a patient clean the arm before they sit and come inside the dialysis uh, unit, uh, hand hygiene, using proper cleaning technique before the needle is inserted, all of these techniques have been practiced properly with regular universal guidelines, I think, uh, can help with the reduction in the infection rate. Uh, cannulation, this is one big hurdle that we depend a lot on how the nurses get trained and how they how they cannulate the access. Access cannulation has to be performed, especially in the fistulas. Uh, I've seen where the tourniquet is not tied. Patients try to, I mean, the nurses try to cannulate the fistula without tying the tourniquet. Do you draw blood? Or lab work without without tying a tourniquet. If you never do that, so why should the fistula be cannulated without tying a tourniquet? But that's often practiced, and, and that leads to infiltration and, uh, and, 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 and and issues where you cannot place the needles in, and the patient then may land up with a catheter. Uh, the, the cannulation technique, the rope ladder technique. Let, let me just ask here. Uh, what kind of cannulation technique is used here on a routine basis? Let, let me see show of hands. Uh, rope ladder technique, is, is that what is common practice here in, in, in Peru? Or is it uh, something else? Rope ladder technique, okay. Yeah, because, and, and again, you don't want to cannulate an aneurysm. So this, this is as it is a huge aneurysm. This is a huge aneurysm. It's easy target. You can put the needle in. And, and actually, the needle was placed in. A blood clot there. That's a disaster, right? You don't want to do this. Uh, cannulating at the same side. So, this is a graft which was being cannulated at the same side leads to an aneurysm formation. Single side cannulation can increase the risk of aneurysm, it can increase the risk of uh, pseudo aneurysms. And, and it, it doesn't really matter whether, whether you're using uh, a buttonhole technique or a rope ladder technique. Uh, Again, I'm, I'm not going to focus much on the buttonhole technique, but that's something that came into uh, real popularity a few years ago, and we've seen that it leads to more infections if the technique is not right, if it's not the right kind of patient. And, and But in the right patient, it definitely has a role, but not as a routine general standard way of cannulating the access. So, so in, in, this, in this study, done over in nine countries with 170 units and almost 7,000 patients, uh, really it did not matter whether whether the cannulation was done with a buttonhole technique or rope ladder technique. But what really matters is what size needle is being used and what kind of flows are being used. So I'll tell you in the United States, the, the practice is push everyone towards 400 blood flow no matter whether the fistula can support it or not. And if you use that protocol, it's definitely going to go in the fistula. If the fistula is not that robust, if the fistula is not big enough to support 400 blood flow, and you try to achieve 400 blood flow through a smaller needle, you're causing more turbulence, more shear stress, more thrombosis, more stenosis. So really one has to pay focus on what size needle is the fistula can accommodate, and Based on the needle size, your uh, the, the flow rate should be set. So, so if you give the needle size is 17 gauge, that's the maximum that you can get into a fistula. As you can see from this study, 
you have the you have the uh, patient numbers close, and here is the venous pressure. Higher the venous pressure, more is the turbulence. So 17 gauge meter, if you go higher on, on the blood flow, your, your pressures are going to be higher. So your maximum number of patients with 17 gauge blood flow falls in in the less than uh, 200 blood flow. 16 gauge needles, you can achieve up to 350 flows. And with 14 and 15 gauge needles, you can get up to 400 flows or higher. So you really want to target your, your or you want to write your prescriptions based on what the fistula size is and what kind of needles are being used. And, and venous pressures matter. If the venous pressure is too high, from the same study as you can see, if the venous pressure is too high, if it's more than 300, those fistulas tend to fail. If the venous pressure is low, I mean the 100 to 150 range, they tend to survive longer. So if you want to maintain long-term patency, using the right size needle and the right size blood flow is, is equally important. It's also equally important, as I mentioned earlier, care while the needle is being removed. So the needle bevel has a very sharp edge. So you don't want to apply pressure when the needle bevel is coming out of the vessel wall. So you have to maintain the angle at which the needle went in. Wait to apply pressure until the needle tip is out of the vessel wall. And then apply pressure with fingers rather than with a clamp. Is, is clamp being used here? In, is that a common practice? Any, any show of hands? Is clamp is being used? Uh, are you familiar with the clamp? Yes, no? No. So, so that's a good thing if, if the clamp is not being used. And I'll show, show you in my next slide what the clamp is. If you have not seen, forget about it. You don't want to use it ever. So holding pressure for 10 to 12 minutes without occluding the flow underneath your finger. So that's that's how the pressure needs to be maintained so that the flow is constantly maintained in the fissure. You don't want to occlude the flow completely. So you don't want to apply too much pressure and you don't want to apply too little pressure. And that adjustment can be done only with your fingers and not with a clamp where there's a fixed pressure. So that's a clamp that some centers use. So this is a spring clamp. It applies a lot of pressure. It actually occludes the vessel flow. And, and once the flow is occluded, obviously you can increase the risk for thrombosis. If for some reason you do have to use the clamp, don't put the clamp on both your needle punctures at the same time. Do one at a time. So at least that way you are minimizing the risk of thrombosis with the use of clamps. So consider AV axis evaluation. There are various clinical clues that you that are that that you get from your daily assessment of the dialysis patients. So if there is difficulty with cannulation, that patient needs to be assessed and, and not wait for it to clot or thrombose. If your venous alarms are arterial alarms are too frequent, if your venous alarm both as as a routine, if both of them venous alarm is more than 200 or the arterial alarm is more than 200, that's that's a that's a trigger point for me. Uh, you return a blood flow of 300 and you're getting only 250 on a consistent basis, there's a problem. Uh, prolonged bleeding. Generally, most bleeding will stop within 10 to 15 minutes. If it's more than 15 minutes, then again, that really needs to be looked into. Very likely, there is uh, outflow stenosis. And then persistent low clearance. So persistent low clearance, if your monthly URR or monthly KTORV is less than your target, so you want your URR at least in the US, that those are the general standards, KTORV over 1.2 minimum, URR over 65%, which is the UDR reduction ratio. If it's more than 65%, that's a reasonably acceptable dialysis clearance. If your solid clearance is low uh, on, on, on a regular basis, that's, that's an issue with, with the access that needs to be evaluated. So the take home points here is access focused education is key, both for the patient as well as for the staff to preserve AV access. Regular monitoring should be an integral part of AV access care. Dialyze at the appropriate needle size and timely detection and intervention of the dysfunctional access, whatever may be your resources available, whether it's surgical or interventional, endovascular.
Uh, thank you very much for your attention. You really don't want your patients to run away. <laughs>